Before we begin, if you're just joining us uh, right now, please uh, don't forget to silence your cell phone and also other devices that might be distracting. Thank you. We did begin uh, the program with a land acknowledgement, but I do want to reiterate that UC Berkeley sits on the territory of Uchun, the ancestral and an unceded land of <clears throat> the Chochenyo uh, Ohlone. Now, it is my pleasure to introduce uh, Professor Keith Putterman, Associate Professor and Interim Chair of Public Studies here at Berkeley, who's going to say well, just a, a brief welcome. Keith? Hi, greetings, everybody. Can you hear me okay? Wait, is it a little warm? Have you noticed? <laughs> <laughs> yes, it's, um, it's, it's all of the energy in the room is um, <laughs> raising the temperature, which is so great. Um, greetings and, and welcome. What a wonderful and really joyous occasion to, um, to come together. Um, it's a real uh, delight to share this, this time and, and space together to celebrate our dear colleague, Michael Omi, um, together here in person in, in particular. It's a real, real joy and, and uh, a privilege that I don't know that um, we thought about how wonderful it would be to, to, to be together, uh, to, um, to think and, and, and celebrate. So thank you all for joining this afternoon. I'll pass the mic back to Professor Ulm in just a moment. Uh, but as interim chair of the Department of Ethnic Studies, I was asked to offer a very brief reflection um, on Michael the scholar and or Michael the colleague. Um, so to do so, uh, let me highlight one way I can sort of answer both of these prompts um, simultaneously as the scholar and the colleague come together. And so um, think of it maybe as a prism and we could shift from reflection to refraction. So in the 2014 edition of Racial Formation in the United States, um, Omi and Wyna offer what they call a radical pragmatist politics of race. And it's a concept that I don't think appears in the 86 or 94 editions of the book. I'm glad you're, you're nodding. <laughs> Um, but the, the lineage for this idea comes through Du Bois and John Dewey, through CLR James and Grace Lee Bobbs. And a radical race pragmatism, in their view, joins self reflective action with situated creativity, the agential capacity that is to consider thoughtfully about what one does in the world and to rethink and reshape one's actions based on such reflections. And then also to experiment, to create, to envision, to imagine, to narrate, to sketch, to build, and rebuild with a keen sense of the conditions in which one lives. Perhaps that's one way to think about the kind of shifting emphases that we can track across the various editions of the book Racial Formation. That the editions themselves express a certain kind of radical race pragmatism. That the conditions for adequately addressing processes of racialization change. And that reflection, revision, and creative recasting are in fact necessary to address the changing nature of race in the United States and indeed in the world. And one thing I love about the third edition of this book is how open Michael and how we are about their revisioning process. I think it's instructive for, for all of us in imagining what, what the practice of a radical pragmatist politics of race might look like. Now, I think radical race pragmatism is also a prism we might use to think about Michael's incredible work as a colleague on this campus. This has already been emphasized throughout the day. Michael builds and shapes and reshapes spaces to do critical work on race, always attentive to the context, 
always attentive to possibility. From the Institute for the Study for Social Change to the Haas Institute for a Fair and Inclusive Society to the Asian American Research Center. In the Department of Ethnic Studies where I've um, been so grateful to be on the faculty since 2009, Michael has always been kind and deliberate, a caring, thoughtful and collaborative steward of the legacy of liberation struggles that bring the field and indeed the department into being, tirelessly working to find ways to lift up the possibility of impactful scholarship on race today. Michael's always brought a creative and reflective energy to our department, always ready to offer insight and experience with humility and a spirit of collaboration. Around our table in the Barber Christian Conference Room, or recently in those strange black boxes of Zoom, Michael has modeled how to keep an even keel, how to see the long run, and his presence and engagement in the life of the department will be truly missed. Personally, it's not only been a true honor, but a real and honest pleasure to share space and ideas with you. And I look forward to continuing to learn from you in the years ahead. So with that, let me pass the mic back to my wonderful colleague, Professor Kataria Um, who will be serving as the moderator for today's session. Thank you so much, Keith, for a wonderful opening remarks. During Michael's 35 years here at Berkeley, it's very obvious that he has touched many, many, many lives. And students love you, Michael. Colleagues love you. We all want to be Michael. <laughs> <laughs> so um, I know that as an ads faculty, uh, it has been an honor and a pleasure uh, to share space with you, as we have said, to be a colleague and I've known you for many, many years now um, and look forward to learning you know, from you uh, for many, many more years. I've always appreciated your calm comportment, your gentle spirit uh, during meetings, uh, and also just in terms of our conversations. And above all, I think your ability to finesse difficult conversations that are important to have. And so I, I truly am grateful for your presence and for all that you do for ads uh, and beyond. And so thank you, Michael. Among the many, many accomplishments and contributions, as Professor Omi has advised many graduate students, three of whom are on this panel today. The breadth of their scholarship and engagement will give you some indication of the scope of Michael's intellectual contributions and influence, not just in one field, but across multiple fields. And today, more than ever, those interventions and the rippling of interventions are now critical more than ever. And of course, Michael's handprint uh, is, is all over them. So this panel uh, picks up uh, nicely, quite nicely actually, from uh, the statement that I turned to at the end of the last panel, and that is about community engagement. How do we engage community? How does Michael's intellectual contributions his theoretical travel outside and beyond the academy? And so this panel will focus on engaged scholarship and the various ways that Michael's work has been applied in work on and within specific communities, as well as relationally across communities. So we're gonna hear from five wonderful scholars who will reflect on how their work has been shaped by Michael. Uh, each of us will speak for about 10 minutes or so. And, uh, Ask that you save your questions and comments until the end of the panel, panel as we did earlier. Michael will uh, give some brief remarks later on in the program. In the interest of time, I will keep my introductions very brief, but you can also find the links to the speaker bios uh, on the symposium website, so please check them out. So first of all, it is my great pleasure to introduce Edward Park, Professor and Chair of Asian American and A Asian and Asian American Studies at Loyola Marymount University. Professor Park was actually Michael's first advisor. Mm -hmm. Professor <laughs> Park. <laughs> Wait, despite, uh, as
as an advisee, it's been a long while. And I get older, as I get older, I just uh, keep going off the script. And so, um, given the long relationship I had, I just wanted to share my thoughts in writing. So back in late 1980s and into the early 1990s, carrying the first edition of Racial Formations <laughs> with its bright red cover to academic conferences was something of a secret badge to a secret society. <laughs> Having racial formation on your person or citing the book in a presentation or a conversation meant that you resisted one of the few areas of consensus among the warring factions in American humanities and social sciences during that time. While the neoconservatives on the right, the neo-Marxists on the left, and the establishment liberals in the middle literally disagreed about every aspect of American society, they agreed that race was at best of marginal importance, a phantom epiphenomena for the theorist and an error and residual for the empiricist. Those of us in the secret society knew something that these gatekeepers did not know. We knew that race was and is one of the fundamental organizing principles of American society and that the skirmishes of racial politics that Michael and Howie wrote about were merely a prelude to a multicultural reckoning that were about to come. Indeed, a book that read as a corrective to the conventional wisdom of American social sciences at the time of its publication quickly became a work of divination that provided the vocabulary and the framework to understand the most dramatic crisis and shock to the American social fabric and body politic. From the Los Angeles civil unrest of 1992 to the Black Lives Matter protest of 2020 and the election of Barack Obama in 2008 to the backlash of Donald Trump in 2016, racial formation has become the indispensable work that allows us to grasp the fundamental dynamics between state and society in our age of race and intersecting identities. In keeping with the theme of this panel, I would like to share with you how racial formations has impacted three communities that I have been part of. First, the community that racial formation most directly impacted has been the community of academics and scholars. This was especially true for graduate students in traditional disciplines, as mentioned by so many folks, not too long ago, who desperately wanted to work specifically on race and racial formations. Formations. Before racial formations, the book found its traction. People who worked on race as an emergent force in traditional departments had a difficult time finding advisors and committee members. Indeed, these senior faculty members were the very ones who produced a scholarship that reductively subsumed race under categories of ethnicity, class, and nation. To assert that it was race that mattered most in the organization of the high tech industry in Silicon Valley or in the immigrant led labor movement in Los Angeles was to invite criticism for pursuing a speculative project that lacked the intellectual rigor theoretical sophistication, and a robust bibliography. If we fast forward just two decades from the early 1990s, we see vastly different professional landscape for those of us who's, who pursue scholarship and teaching on race and racial formation. From the breathtaking rise of racial and ethnic studies scholars into the leadership of American Studies Association, to the growth of critical racial studies within the traditional humanities and social sciences departments, to the dominance of critical race theory within law schools, those of us who study and teach race now do so explicitly and without apology. The central tenets of racial formations has become common sense in American academia today. And this has created the intellectual space for an explosion of scholarship and teaching, and I believe contributed greatly to the diversity of academia itself. Right? Um, work remains to be done. Second community that I will mention is that from 1992 to 1996, I had the pleasure of serving as the director of research for the Korean Immigrant Workers Advocates of Los Angeles. 
as a part of our coalition effort, uh, one of my responsibilities was to attend meetings with local labor unions and community-based organizations in LA. This was the heyday of LA immigrant activism with the massive immigrant rights protest and immigrant labor activism that united Latinos and Asian immigrant workers and low-income re residents across the region. In attending these meetings, I began noticing the books on the bookshelves of various organizers. What seemed uncanny was that the bookshelves of longtime activists and people in leadership were filled with classic monthly review books, invariably led by Baron and Sweezy's Monopoly Capital and Harry Broderman's Labor and Monopoly Capital. More recent books may have included Stood Turfitt's Working and Bluestone and Harrison's uh, Deindustrialization of America. While these are all fine books with wonderful and compelling ideas, I was not sure how these books about the plight of white working class in Rust Belt America applied to organizing Latino and Asian immigrants in post-industrial LA. Many of these folks were undocumented immigrants, fighting small-time co-ethnic subcontractors who were far, far removed from being monopoly capitalists. The bookshelves of new organizers, however, had fewer books, but they were completely different. Memorable ones include Patricia Hill Coleman's Black Feminist Thought, Vicki Ruiz's Cannery Woman, Cannery Lives, Ronald Tukaki's Iron Cages, Yenli Asperitu's Asian American Panicity. And of course, these books were anchored by Michael Oney and Howard Bernard's racial formation in the United States with its bright red color. Many of these young activists grew up in these communities that they were organizing, and they int intimately knew their communities. They knew from their experiences that racial empowerment was the first necessary step in their community's path to economic mobility and political participation. This is, I think, one of the reasons why racial formation is such a powerful teaching tool. For generations of, generations of students now, the book crystallized their understanding of America from the vantage point of East LA or Koreatown. And the book became the foundation of not only their intellectual development, but of their practice. Finally, I think I'm going to be contradicting Gary here, uh, Oka okay, Hero. In 2005, I was lucky enough to get a Fulbright as, at the University of Tokyo. During my time, I participated in various activities within the Korean Japanese community. One of the emergent issues during this time was that many Korean Japanese were pivoting from their Korean identity based on myriads of terms of identification that stem from the vexing view of Korean and Japanese history. By 2005, it became obvious that a growing number of young Korean Japanese began adopting the English term Korean to self-identify who they are. This term would allow Korean Japanese to sidestep two challenging challenges of self-identification. First, whether or not they naturalized into Japanese citizenship um, or held on to their Korean ethnic identity. And second, if they did not naturalize into Japanese citizenship, whether they identified with North or South Korea, two countries that they never been. The driving force behind this creative resistance was necessitated by the decision by the Japanese government, which made it, made it much easier uh, to become a naturalized citizen. Right? And they did so to minimize its growing population of perpetual foreigners who were born in Japan but did not have Japanese citizenship. State policies also sought to deal with the nation's racial and ethnic diversity more efficiently by decoupling citizenship with ideas of ethnicity, culture, and national origins as Japan faced a, a demographic crash. Faced with the state policy, the response of Korean Japanese population was an attempt to find a unified identity of their own. And they settled on borrowing one from the United States. To explore this phenomenon, a group of Korean Japanese and South Korean graduate students at the University of Tokyo organized a seminar. And they invited me, the new American Fulbright professor in the American Studies program, to give their first seminar over a carefully 
carefully chosen reading. Imagine my surprise when I opened up the package. <laughs> Part two of racial formation in the United States. Chapter four, racial formation. Chapter five, the racial Thank you so much. <laughs> Thank you so much, Ed. Thank you for that wonderful, um, wonderful comments and reflections. Um, next, we will hear from Professor Jessica Vasquez, um, Vasquez Topos, Professor of Sociology at the University of Oregon, and also one of Michael's advisees. Welcome, Professor Vasquez Topos. Thank you all. Uh, thank you for the, to the institutes and uh, congratulations, Michael. I did uh, create a PowerPoint, so I'll see how this is going. Uh, so, Professor Michael Lomi is an academic touchstone for me. My mother is the archivist, so thank you, Mom, for sending this out from the archives. To defer to the dictionary definition of touchstone, Michael, to my mind, is indeed an excellent quality or example of a scholar including being a kind mentor. I first met Michael when I was a graduate student in sociology here at Berkeley. I heard he was famous for his work on race, but more immediately, I was in need of a mentor for my qualifying exams in race, and a mentor I got. As I read and read and read for my qualifying exams in race to understand the quote, state of the field, Michael guided my intellectual growth with him. Oh, yeah. He counseled rather than criticized. He built me up. As I read in the field of race, he tasked me with finding holes or gaps in the literature. This is common advice, but the care comes in when the guidance is meant to help identify my own interests and sharpen my eyesight to see where my own scholarship might eventually contribute. So on to racial formation in the United States, co-authored of course by Michael and Howard Bonant. A peek at Google Scholar tells us that it's been cited about 17,000 times. I regularly teach racial formation and I learn something Every time we meet, that's something we learn every time. So I appreciate much about racial formation. I appreciate the race is not reducible to class argument, racial projects, role of the state and of collective action, the positioning of race as a master category, but without excluding the existence of additional master categories leaving the door open for intersectionality, the notion that multiple axes of domination operate simultaneously. My engagement with racial formation led to a recent publication on what Priscilla Yeaman and I call the, the racialization of privacy. And I'd like to thank Michael publicly now for providing constructive feedback on an earlier draft of this paper. Where did the inspiration for this title or this article come from? I did as Michael taught me in my qualifying exams. Identify a curiosity that you have an extension that you would like to see. For me, that was family. I wanted to see more family in racial formation. Priscilla and I used insights from racial formation to advance the ar our argument that access to family privacy is apportioned by race. Note the subtitle here, uh, racial formation as a family affair. Our notion of the racialization of privacy refers to the phenomenon that family privacy including the freedom to create a family uninhibited by law, pressure, and custom is delimited by race. We conduct an ideological genealogy as we examine three cases, Native American boarding school system, eugenic laws and practices, and contemporary deportation. We contend that state-sponsored curtailments of family privacy are racial projects that shape the racial state. So families are central to racial formation and the institutionalization of white supremacy. I am mindful that this panel has the key word relationality. We better see privilege by relationally discerning oppression. The legal foundations for the racialization of privacy show disparity. Oops. So we know that Roe v. Wade in 1973 secured a woman's right to privacy, prohibiting government intrusion into her decisions about reproduction. In the Roe v. Wade uh, verdict, Justice Harry Blackman argued that past cases on marriage, contraception, and child, child rearing created a quote unquote zone of privacy. Thus in Roe v. Wade, women won the legal right to choose abortion based on a notion of privacy free from government interference. 
Just five years after Roe was decided, in stark contrast, 10 Mexican origin women lost a class action suit against uh, physicians at the University of Southern California, Los Angeles County Medical Center. In the 1978 case, Madrigal versus Hooligan, the judge ruled in favor of the doctors accused of coercively sterilizing the Mexican origin women. The plaintiffs claimed that state, federal officials, and, admi and administrators and doctors at the LA County Medical Center violated their constitutional right to procreate. The women used the decision in Roe v. Wade to argue that they possessed the right to privacy relative to child rearing and that their forced sterilizations were unlawful breaches of authority. Given that the Madrigal decision followed the Roe decision by five years, the juxtaposition between court rulings carving out reproductive rights for white women with resources while denying those rights to poor women of color is striking. The reproductive justice premise holds that, women, that people deserve the right to abortion and the right to care for children. The racialization of privacy lens shows that family formation freedom or lack thereof is an outgrowth of racial projects that ultimately constitute nation making vis-a-vis -vis families. I'd offer that it would be interesting to take a racialization of privacy lens uh, to the US Supreme Court's recent decision to let stand Texas's ban on abortions after six weeks of pregnancy. Also in September, and highlighting global relationality, Mexico's 14 Supreme Court justices ruled it unconstitutional to punish abortion as a crime. Back to the racialization of privacy article. We lead off each empirical section with a quotation from Bumi Wanath that we pursue Throughout analysis, I'll draw your attention to a couple uh, phrases. With the passage of the Indian Removal Act in 1830, President Jackson enforced the physical removal of Native Americans under the guns and bayonets of the US Army. Signaling war and settler colonialism, the War Department ordered the opening of Indian boarding schools, which were to function under military authority. Families are central to the deconstruction, or sorry, families are central to the destruction of Native nations and the construction of U.S. simultaneous. Native American children were removed from their families, culture, and language and placed in boarding schools so they might mirror white family models. Some Natives resisted and reclaimed their children. In response, in 1881, Congress authorized the Indian Bureau to deny treaty guaranteed benefits of rations and clothing to parents if children failed to attend. This forced assimilation model that broke up Native families and forced them into a white family mold attempted to hammer in to Native and non-Native psyches a racial and family privacy issue. Popular culture of the early 1900s was steeped in eugenic ideology. One example of the visible exertion of racial state power that extolled whiteness are bitter family contests held at state fairs. These contests judge contestants' white lineage through genealogical investigation and put their whiteness or their fitness on display for reward. Fitter family contests as eugenic propaganda helped entrench white supremacy and the myth of racial purity, as well as illustrate how family formation was the center of the reproduction of whiteness. The first contest was held at a state fair in Topeka, Kansas in 1920. By the end of the decade, fitter family contests were features of many state fairs that were, and were so popular, they were given front page coverage in local newspapers. Awarding a quote unquote governor's trophy highlights the role of the state in literally prizing one race and families within that race over others. Centering racialized heterosexuality, prizes were also awarded for the best baby and young couples commencing eugenic marriages. Racial politics are plainly on display in everyday life at the state fair. Black and Latino people in the US become uh, easy quote unquote human, target, human targets as Victor Rios aptly calls them because they are surveilled or policed and not granted the right to privacy. Through deportation, the state bars certain, certain groups from creating or maintaining families. Former President Trump's zero, tol zero tolerance immigration policy that separated over 3,900 children from their families at the Southern border exemplifies the racialization of privacy vis-a-vis -vis deportation. In zero tolerance, the state authorized the fracturing of Central American migrant families, read would be American families and granted asylum. In 2015, Donald Trump stated his plans to deport all undocumented immigrants from the US in mass saying, quote, we have to keep families together, but they have to go. 
Representative Steve Kate of Iowa, who reintroduced the Birthright Citizenship Act to end birthright citizenship for children born on US soil and to documented immigrants declared, we can't restore our civilization with somebody else's babies. And Underpinned by eugenic thought, the phrase somebody else's baby centers both citizenship and civilization in white families and demonizes non-white fertility as a threat. By the concept racialization of privacy, we can identify how the state seeks to reproduce institutionalized white supremacy via families and the effects this has on families. Fruitfully extending only and white ants work into families, we argue that families are the linchpin in state-sponsored state racial projects that construct the nation, and that the racialization of privacy as a form of inequality is a defining characteristic of the color line. As a qualitative sociologist, I'm used to mining, I'm used to mining data, um, interview narratives in my case, and yet I go back to racial formation to mine theory and launch from it to better understand the gravity and nuance of race and its implication in ideology, practice, nation, nation state building, and family. Michael's work offers a robust scaffolding that invites extensions like the trunk of a tree that supports branches, offshoots, leaves, and blooms. Whether Michael knows it or not, I am considering him a lifelong mentor. I appreciate all he has taught me through his scholarship and mentorship, and I hope I do him some honor as I strive to be. Thank you so much, Jessica, for that wonderful presentation. I'm delighted to welcome next uh, uh, Professor Linda Junho, uh, Professor of Asian American Studies at UC Irvine. Professor Wo was mentored by Michael, uh, Professor Oni, during her postdoctoral fellowship at Berkeley. Professor Wo. Thank you, Kataria, and the organizers of this um, panel. I'm just really, really pleased to be here. It's been a really important dialogue since I've been cloistered in lots of my uh, house for a year and a half. <laughs> um, without a doubt, Michael Omi's work has shaped multiple fields, and his landmark book, Racial Formation with Howard Why Not, has been cited countless times and, and has been taught in numerous courses. In 1986, when the book was published, Asian American studies was really established, but it was evolving and morphing. Their work has been instrumental for social scientists studying Asian Americans using, using varying research methods, especially community based scholarship. Omi and Renant, why not, cautioned that existing theor that theoretical models could be constructive but limiting in the study of race relations, from the Marxist perspective that overemphasized class to the Chicago School that prompts that promoted a linear assimilation paradigm. Omi and uh, Wynant argued, uh, Omi and Wynant are urged us not to underestimate the centrality of race in the organization of political life in the United States and encourage us to follow their lead, quote, to understand racial change, how concepts and ideologies of race and racism evolve, transform, and shift over historical time. As they articulate in each edition of their book, race and racism in its multiple forms is embedded in systems of power, and the legacies of white supremacy, manifest destiny, and U.S. imperialism impact how we study indigenous populations as well as immigrants and refugees in the U.S. Their work has helped us theorize how race and racism are amorphous at both the macro and the micro level. No matter the period, whether it is the post-civil rights era or the supposed post-racial era, racism has mutated, forcing us to be attentive to the nebulous form. For Asian Americans, the racist rhetoric, anti-Asian violence, prevalent in the yellow period, Carol period of the 19th and early 20th century manifests itself again in the aftermath of 9-11 and in the current COVID-19 pandemic. We are living through a time of efforts to reinstitute and legalize racial inequity and discrimination have become renormalized, often with impunity. We are observing how voting is accessible to more people in record numbers of Asian Americans, along with Black, Latinx, Middle Easterners and indigenous populations participating in the electoral process. However, we are witnessing how hard fought voting rights victories and laws are being eroded with voter suppression tactics and state legislation. 
Since his early publication on Asian American demographics, Michael Omi's analysis pointed the way for scholars to be attuned to the internal differences and positionality of ethnicity, class, and nation. His work with the U.S. Census revealed some of the contradictions of racial classification and its implications, particularly the ways that the multiracial category would expand and even add more complexity to a tenuous grouping. For example, we're, we are observing how the racialized Black, Asian, and gendered lens is being used to situate and sometimes misread Vice President Kamala Harris. The current movement to ban teaching critical race theory in school districts across the country, including the county where I live, distorts ethnic studies and only informs us of the anxiety some Americans have about demographic trends nationally and their fears about how this will shift the structural power. Early on in early scholarship, he rightfully called on us to interrogate how the racial lumping of Asian Americans to be both an asset and a curse. Uh, this is just as important as President Bush. In the 1960s, there were approximately 1 million who identified as Asian American. Now with over 20 ethnic groups, there are 22 million who are dispersed throughout the nation. So Asian Americans have grown remarkably more diverse by every factor, including religion, gender, sexuality, language, and generation. On January 6th of this year at the U.S. Capitol, next to white supremacist groups that are notoriously known for being anti-immigrant and anti-refugee, there were images of Vietnamese bodies, presumably who arrived in the U.S. as immigrants, waving the former South Vietnamese flag. Vietnamese are often described as the only Asian American group that overwhelmingly support Trump at slightly over 50% or so. But we should note that there are other Asian ethnic groups um, uh, right below 50% who support the Republican Party. On the other hand, there is a generational split, younger generation of Vietnamese supporting Democratic candidates and a growing group of Vietnamese American progressives who are speaking up, such as through civic organizations. Similar scenarios exist for other Asian ethnic groups. A segment of Chinese Americans, mainly immigrants, are staunchly anti affirmative action and support and fund candidates and law groups that affirm their viewpoint. They coexist with organizations like Chinese for Affirmative Action that continue with their educational advocacy work. Clearly, the last few years have solidified that race relations and the struggle for racial equity are much more unpredictable, complicated, and multi layered than simply a conflict between white domination. And resistance by the poor color. As Omi lucidly conveyed, the diasporic and transnational Vietnamese population, the diasporic and transnational Asian American population includes a spectrum of folks who range from destitute refugees to ultra rich immigrants, and their lived experiences vary greatly. Incongruity abound with racial scapegoating and petro foreigner imagery of Asian Americans now displayed alongside narratives of them as model minorities or model immigrants. A new generation of Asian Americans are growing up absorbed in K-pop and watching blockbuster films that have merged Asian and Asian American themes like Crazy Rich Asians and shang chi and The Legend of the Ten Rings. The majority of Asian Americans are born outside the US. And we continue to grapple with what this will mean if the population is expected to expand to 46 million in 2060. As Omi and went on to remind us, racialization has forced us to rethink our binary discourses, such as majority versus minority, oppressed versus oppressor, domination versus subordination. The Black Lives Matter movement calls for defunding the police, whereas in some cases, as a response to anti Asian violence, Asian Americans are requesting more policing of their neighborhoods. In our academic and activist interventions, we as scholars cannot discount intersectional racial collectives and coalitions, but neither can we deny the factors that divide racial communities, nor can we afford to glide over the deep divisions within Asian America. As scholars, we have continually called for the disaggregation of our ethnic data, but have we theorized enough about what this will mean for the development of our discipline, for policy making, and for community engaged scholarship? To conduct community-based research for the future, Omi and Wainan's publication, Racial Formation, is still indispensable. 
we must conceptualize communities, not just as space bound territories, but we need to continue to reimagine borders and boundaries that were unimaginable in the late 1980s and the first public. Technology and social media have changed how racialization and racism travels across oceans and terrain. These interconnections are not new, but the recent scale and growth is. While we marvel at the power of the internet to provide access to information and to mobilize movements, we are alarmed at its ability to quickly disseminate misinformation and disinformation on a global scale. Not only can techno-capitalists circulate racist ideologies online, but a single individual or an obscure group can use online platforms to harass racial groups and spread messages of hate. When we use Omi Wainan's foundational work, we can use Omi Wainan's foundational work to theorize how the racial formation of the future means understanding how technology is both a powerful tool to sustain racist structures as well as an invaluable tool to dismantle racial inequity. In closing, I want to thank Michael uh, for being my mentor when I was a chancellor of the National Control Group in the early 1990s. gave me the support I needed at the time when I was unsure that I wanted to stay in the academy. 25 years later, I'm here at your retirement. <laughs> <laughs> so for your retirement, I'm giving you something that you don't need, which is another mug. <laughs> <laughs> Um, but it does have the images on your three editions of your book wow. <laughs> on it. It has a picture of you and Howie. <laughs> and then I did a descriptor for the letters of your, of your first and last name. So for Michael, I thought of mentor, intellectual collaborator, humanitarian, advocate, equalizer, and liberator. For Michael, I came up with, what oh, am I? Um, originator, maverick, and my personal favorite, influencer. <laughs> <laughs> so congratulations, Michael, and your well-deserved retirement. Oh. Thank you for all you've done for us. Thank you so much. Just as we begin the panel with Michael's first advisee, um, our final speaker is Michael's, not final, but our next speaker is Michael's last advisee. Although I'm sure Michael will continue to mentor our students and that he's going to mentor many, many, many students for generations to come. It is my pleasure to welcome Daniel Wu, an American Culture Studies postdoctoral fellow in Ethnic Studies at Washington University in St. Louis, who is joining us virtually. Daniel? Welcome. Hi, Hi, how's everybody doing? Well, first, I just wanted to start off by saying congratulations, Dr. Omi, on your retirement. You truly do deserve all the love that you've been receiving throughout the day. And what an honor it is just to be included among such accomplished critical race scholars. And first, I just want to echo others in noting the, the tremendous contribution that racial formation has made to my scholarly trajectory. Even now, I don't think I can write an article or even a course description for that matter without utilizing some of the key terms that yourself and Dr. Howard Wynon has introduced to us. And before I go on to celebrate our beloved Dr. Michael Omi, I just want to share a bit of background about the work that I do to provide some context on his influence. So my research broadly explores how Asian Americans navigate hip hop as a critical site of Afro-Asian community formation. And in line with other relational race scholars, my research aims to advance a relational consciousness of the racial order and socio-political relationships that challenge white supremacy, especially in the realms of popular culture as well as quotidian common grounds. And rather than centering a framework of hip hop as a site of Afro-Asian political solidarity, my work more deliberately approaches it as one of polycultural community through an analysis of the identities, 
cultural politics and localized spaces collaboratively generated by young Asian and African Americans, as well as other people of color. And much of this extends from my own experiences as a founding member of a predominantly Afro-Latino rap collective based in New York City. And of course, my approach is also significantly developed from my reflections on prevailing narratives of Asian Americans and hip hop that focus on the distinctions between cultural appropriation and appreciation. So for me, it was important that I provide an alternative window by centering the narratives of select Asian American rappers whose cultural practices are both informed by and produce further opportunities for Afro-Asian relationships and collaborations. But let me take a step back from my research and show some love for the man of the hour, Dr. Michael Omi. And on a basic level, my relational race praxis, like others, is significantly informed by how the concept of racial formation opened up questions of process, right? And also broadened my understanding of the multiple racial projects operating at the same time, as well as across time. And in regards to Dr. Omi's mentorship, his work with myself and others here, as folks have mentioned, really shows his range as a scholar and advisor, right? He was able to guide my work on a topic that isn't necessarily his specialization or really familiar to him for that matter. Though he did know who DJ Cool Herc was, so that was cool. <laughs> um, But nevertheless, he was able to speak to the substance of my research by helping me articulate the polycultural dynamics that I aim to trace through a lens of regional racial formation, as well as by underscoring how my notions of community therein uniquely presented a alternative racial common sense that critically challenged racial hegemony. And clearly he has been far too gracious about my work. And relatedly, he always reminded me to really value my own situated knowledge in shaping the scholarly contributions that I sought to make. And he made me feel like an expert when I felt far from it, right? But let me briefly return to the content of my research to more fully illustrate his influence. So my book manuscript is tentatively titled Asian Americans in the Cipher, Regional Racial Formation, Hip Hop Aesthetics and Scenes of Afro-Asian Collaboration. And the existing version of this project explores the racial experiences, aesthetics, and cultural politics of independent Asian American rappers from New York City, Northern Virginia, and North Carolina. And specifically, I center those who are from majority non-white multiracial neighborhoods or otherwise localities that allow for routine interminority encounters to examine how these Asian American rappers every day racialized landscape shape their participation in hip hop concomitant with intimate and politically informed interracial relationships. And I trace the mutual constitution of race, place and hip hop and the Asian American rappers life histories, music and cultural production and scenes of performance, which are often majority non-white and Afro-Asian multiracial spaces. And here, Dr. Omi was especially helpful in pointing out the collaborative dynamics between performers and audience and between audience members themselves that I should hone in on through a sociological lens in order to analyze these scenes of performance as sites of Afro-Asian community formation and how they present an alternative racial common sense that complicates how we might evaluate cultural exchanges and relations between young people of color. And his and Dr. Howard Wynant's framework of racial hegemony really gave me the language to articulate the socio-political significance of my project because I wasn't necessarily focusing on overt people of color politics. And thinking about the interplay between cultural representation and social structure in the racial formation of the US, how important it is for us to advance a relational race praxis and the social realities we already find ourselves in, in conjunction with our participation in 
larger scale political actions. And in this current historical moment, we arrived at a critical juncture in which Afro-Asian solidarity in its multiple forms are extremely necessary. And I'm so grateful that Dr. Omi will continue to be a mentor and friend as I continue on my, my academic path. And if I may, I just wanted to conclude with some general remarks about his mentorship. So Dr. Omi has been really great about accommodating me as a mentee, right? We never explicitly addressed this, but very early on, given where I was at in my professional development, I believe he understood that I was a student that would need more directed guidance to fully realize my potential. And he spent countless hours, and I say that without exaggeration, he spent hours and hours just patiently listening to what at that time was my very disorganized thoughts, right? And he never made me feel like I was taking up his precious time, though we all know he's an extremely busy man. And he also asked a lot of questions to learn more about hip hop and my experiences and take on it. And over the years, as we got closer, I appreciated how direct he was with me, which I'm not sure is a quality folks would immediately associate with him. But I remember one time after he reviewed a first draft of a dissertation chapter, he was basically like, Daniel, you have a lot of great stuff here, but you have a tendency to go off into the world sometimes. And he was absolutely right and always followed up by guiding me through the work that I had to do, including navigating the academic job market, which is really why I have my current position and I'm able to pay rent for my apartment <laughs> and I'm just forever grateful for his kindness, mentorship, and now friendship. That's my homie only. <laughs> and I wish I was there to celebrate with you in person. I miss you and I'll get up with you soon. Thank you. Fantastic. Well, I'm very sorry that I can't be with you here there in person as for medical reasons, but I'm extremely grateful to take part in this celebration of Michael Omi of his work and his career at UC Berkeley. I can now see the audience for the first time, so that's fantastic. And also I know so many of you, so my greetings to everyone. Um, I think I'll start with some remarks on our friendship and our collaboration, and then I'll say some brief things about racial formation in, um, in the United States, and uh, hopefully be pretty brief. Um, you know, picture from 1986. Can you see that okay? It's a photo that was uh, included in the first edition of uh, Racial Formation as the author. Uh, it was taken by Stephen Okazaki, the film director in San Francisco in 1986. In 1986, Michael and I already had known each other for more than 10 years. So um, we have been friends and collaborators for 45 years, people. We met in 1975 and we began our work together as graduate students and activists, um, graduate students and then uh, members of the Socialist Review Collective in the Bay Area and anti-racist activists. Our relationship is 
a really unique collaboration. It extends way beyond ordinary collegiality. Um, without question, Michael's contributions to the field of ethnic studies, sociology, um, to racial theory, to UC Berkeley, and to the Asian American and Japanese American communities are really quite endless, quite unique. But what he's given to me is really in another category. It's beyond precious. Um, for almost all the time since 1975, maybe a few years, starting a few years after we first met. And I can remember the, the actual meeting. And, you know, I re remember being introduced to Michael on the campus of UC Santa Cruz. Um, but from all, almost all the time since we first met, we've been working together. Um, and our work and our lives deeply overlap in so many different ways. It's a unique story for which I'm deeply grateful. And I think there's a lesson here, which is about the meaning not only of my work with Michael, Michael's work with me, but also all our work. We are all, not just Michael and me, but all of us dependent on each other and collaborators with each other, often in ways we don't no, we don't consciously appreciate. I think for Michael and, and me, we have come to be pretty conscious about the importance of each other for ourselves. I mean, the way we have created each other, <clears throat> as well as creating the work we've done together. Sorry for my voice. Um, you know, Troy re referred, Troy Duster referred to racial formation as a canon, that, um, which is, of course, nice to hear. Uh, but what's emerging here, I mean, from this kind of this event, as much as from many other sources, is how much co um, collaboration and dialogue, comradeship, interdependence, and yes, love, are deeply involved in our struggles and our accomplishments, both academic and political activists, both intellectual and activists. I think that is true. That's the true and deeper meaning of the term canon, at least as it applies to racial formation. So thank you, Michael, for just being there for me and being here with me over all these decades in so many different places and in so many different projects, racial projects indeed. Okay, some quick notes on racial formation theory. I think it's clear and it's perhaps obvious that racial formation is a dynamic process. Both race and racism are unstable, as we say so often. They are decentered social relationships constantly being made and remade in practice. The meaning of race, the social structure of race, and every aspect of race, uh, all these things are fundamentally political. And when you think about racial formation in this context, it means quite quickly is again becomes obvious that race includes this race spans this huge area of our lives and of our society and there is a way we can argue that nothing absolutely nothing is outside race so far from uh, seeing it as a you know an aberration or a uh, a leftover from a previous time or something like that, we need to understand, and I hope racial formation theory helps us understand how comprehensive race is in our world, not only in the United States, but the world as a whole. So race, 
runs the, the gamut. It spans everything from coercion and despotism and indeed genocide and um, exile and all that, you know, racial dictatorship, we've called it in some of our work, all the way to liberation, uh, real democracy, abolition democracy, to use du, du Bois's phrase, um, emancipation. Um, so, democratic self-determination and racial despotism that's one way of thinking of that spectrum uh, but race also operates at the micro level so that's a macro level perspective but the micro level is also central indeed race racial formation links the micro and macro levels of social relationships, so, uh, socialized society, comprehensively. Racial formation theory, I would like to suggest, allows us to think of race as an ongoing set of social and political relationships, both fundamental to modern society, and if you follow the, my late and great colleague, Cedric Robinson, fundamental to pre-modern society and also unstable, always subject to political struggle. So to understand the racial state, to, local, to locate the centrality of race and capitalism, and we now talk again, thank you, Cedric, we now talk a lot about racial capitalism, that's important, but also to understand the centrality of race and capitalism, the centrality of race and colonialism and anti-colonialism, we need to center racial formation and the political struggles that it involves in the broadest and deepest sense. We need to have a, a, an ongoing racial formation perspective, but also to understand racial identity, othering and belonging, as John Powell would say, and so many other dimensions of our identity, the politics of the personal, the politicization of the social, we need to have a racial formation perspective. It would be extremely difficult to grasp intersectionality, to grasp critical race theory without drawing on racial formation. So in many ways, um, Racial formation theory remains important to us, and yet racial formation theory is not, was not new. It wasn't really something we invented. Maybe we gave a name to it, but it was and remains a synthesis, an interpretation of work done by many people long before we came on the scene. Pioneers, the pioneers who came before us, above all W.E.B. Du Bois, but even also even earlier pioneers. And in the 20th century, people like Alan Locke, Anna Julia Cooper, Audre Lorde, St. Saint, Saint Clair J Drake, Seward Hall, Paul Gilroy, Ron Zakaki, numerous others. These are the folks who shaped us, who, who not only influenced us, but who developed the concepts that we synthesized. We drew deeply on Troy Duster's work, on Herbert Bloomer and symbolic interaction, on Gramsci and his followers, uh, Chantal Mouffe and Ernesto Leclau, on Frankfurt School scholars, and on many others. So, you know, it, it, it's nice to be uh, the, the authors of a canon, but really is something about our work that we should look at uh, more critically and more modestly, I think. Um, we did not invent racial formation. Um, no question that we put concepts together. We were an influence on critical race theory, for example. Uh, I think Michael even blurred the big red book that uh, Kim Crenshaw et al. edited in uh, 
what, 1995? I'm not sure what the date of publication was. Um, what we were offering, what we offer is a race theory that I, that, as I say, allows us to understand race as a dynamic, ongoing outcome of political struggle. And as Gary Okahiro pointed out before, racial formation offers a method for understanding race and challenging racism. Our concept of racial project is an example of this. So in this way, um, it's important to recognize that racial forma formation theory um, it, it itself is very dynamic, as race and racism are very dynamic. It's not finished. It's not complete. It's not even as coherent as it should be. Michael pointed out uh, earlier in this, uh, in this uh, event Michael pointed out that we really are not clear on the meaning of anti-racism, how we understand opposing racism, what that means, how that, how that works, what, what are the different projects that anti-racism involves. This is just an example among many others of ways that racial formation theory is being developed, not by us, but by you and by the many people who have made use, and in some ways misuse, I guess, of our work. So in this way, um, if I can conclude on such a note, let me just say that the work you are doing, so many of the, you that I know and many others that I don't know, uh, that you are doing to take this concept, to take this theoretical apparatus and run with it in so many different ways to talk about so many different dimensions of race and racism today, to uh, look historically, to look comparatively, to look um, at the micro and macro levels of race and racism, to focus on racial politics at this moment when racial reaction is resurgent, but also when there is a broader and deeper anti-racist movement than has existed in this country and in the world for decades. That is our task today. And I'm very grateful for you being here and for your interest and your commitment to this project. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Howie. And we, uh, actually, we also have your own retirement to honor and celebrate as well. Yeah, there you go. So, you know, you started on this 35-year-long journey with, with Michael Lomi, and now you're actually retiring together. So, again, please, a round of applause for Howie. So, thank you again for joining us virtually. And thank you to all of the panelists, you know, for your thoughtful remark. We have some time for questions and discussions, so may I invite the panelists to do that again? You know, fixing our, our gaze on the contemporary landscape and building on what uh, Daniel was a constant um, point about with the importance of relationality and also, of course, um, Harvey's, Harvey's sort of comment about the, uh, the, the liberatory potential of racial formation. Uh, I was wondering if you can reflect on what are sort of the possibilities offered by racial formation, both as a theory but also as a method and as a political project, right, uh, for solidarity politics? For the, uh, what, what are you seeing in the communities? All of you are deeply in, in the communities. So what, what are you actually seeing in terms of this translation uh, in the community of racial formation? Anyone want to start? Sure, okay, correct. Um, so I'm doing uh, 
different uh, product than the one I spoke about today, where I'm interviewing folks with different racial ethnic backgrounds about um, the nation and belonging in the nation. It's like it's important. We're in faculty, and I think part of what is neat about responses to um, interview questions are where I see glimpses of cross-racial solidarity moments, and I think there's sparks um, where empathy can be built. And I, you know, as an interviewer, I'm interviewing people, and I'm not the one to necessarily bring them together, but as people are telling me stories about their racialization, and then I'm reflecting that back to them, and I'm seeing kind of the cross-cutting ways in which this is happening, I think, you know, certainly part of the project of my work is to illuminate that, but I'm hoping that, frankly, in the classroom, that I get some of those conversations built, right, with a racial relations lens and try to unveil some of this for students and uh, help generate conversation where people can get outside of their own lived experience, even as they're asked my classrooms to be reflective about it. So I think that's where some of my work Maybe I'll just focus on the present moment, as I mentioned that in my uh, 10 minutes. Uh, but I think, you know, this past couple of years has really made scholars who work in ethnic studies and race relations, immigration, refugee studies, to really rethink what we've been doing. How do we teach? Um, you know, as I was teaching through Zoom uh, in winter and spring quarter, you know, this year starting in January, every single week I didn't know what I was going to be teaching um, or how to teach it or were my readings outdated because what was happening uh, in the news um, from early January to the Atlantic incident to Black Lives Matter to Trump rising Trumpism to the skepticism of science. I think that some of us were unprepared for the moment we're facing right now and we're going to have to go back and really rethink what have we been studying and is it going to be able to deal with theoretically and empirically what we knew in the past is it going to be applicable to the future and how we think about coalition. Um, I think that COVID-19 the pandemic certainly amplified all kinds of inequalities on a local uh, level, on a national level and also on a global level. And we are going to see hopefully some of those. We already saw some of those for immigrants and refugees who didn't have to think about being, what does it mean to be an American at this time, to want to be an American um, at this time. What does that mean for how we identify it? There are many people who want to hide, who want to be, I would say, a white affiliate, right? <laughs> Within the Asian American population. So, um, but now it's been a wake up call for many of us to rethink the kind of emphasis from healthcare, workplace, etc. And so we're as scholars, we're applying the lines, we're following as fast as we can to try to address whether it's about coalition or conflict. It's really making us rethink, you know, how we used to kind of I used to, in my courses I've been teaching these issues, I understood them, but it has been the most challenging time teach about ethnic about race, about racial formations and theory. You know, I think at this present moment in my, all of my career, my 30 year career, I don't know about 50 years for my <laughs> <laughs> but I think it's been definitely a challenge um, to teach, to research, to write, to think through so many of the issues that we're confronting with. Great. Um, you know, when I went up to the podium, I did not thank uh, Michael for you know, his role in shaping my career and all of that. Um, because I didn't know I could get through my talk if I, if I started with that. But at, at this position, I'm short enough where I can't see Michael. So I really say one thing about Michael. And I think throughout the day, people comment on, commented on the incredible generosity of Michael, generosity of his spirit, generous with his time, with his praise, building people up. Um, it's easy to do that in this business, to people who are above you, people who are your colleagues, and even to assistant professors who might you know, become a superstar and then start doing things. Well, what's unique about Michael is that he 
saves his greatest generosity for his students. And that is just an incredibly difficult thing to do, right? And I think I speak for a lot of students here at Berkeley, both at the undergraduate level and at all levels, who without Michael in their lives might not have finished because of the circumstances of their life. And so Michael, through that generosity, provided the kind of the foundation that allowed us to achieve what we were able to achieve, right? And, and I think that generosity to those folks, you know, who under this sort of power structure are below you, it's just a rare thing. And Michael has that in just abundance. And I think we've all, those of us who've been touched by that, by having him as a mentor, it's just been transformative and unforgettable. Okay. Um, having said that, let me kind of pivot off of this other thing. And this other thing about racial formation theory. I think, you know, what Gary said uh, this morning about how racial formation theory doesn't travel well, right? Because you go to places like Japan, and ordinary Japanese folks have a tough time understanding, grasping what a racial state is and how they're racialized as Japanese in Japan. I think there's something very unique about racial formation that is a, it's a, fundamentally an opposition. And only people who are subject of sort of a bad form of racial formation understand and feel those pressures, right? You, you feel the merging of you with these total strangers based upon these descriptive characteristics. And maybe it is a theory for people who don't have power to choose who you are, right? And, um, and therefore, I think racial formation is a global framework because there are oppressed people everywhere. And oppressed people everywhere are regulated through their bodies um, to be a member in a particular way in a society. So that's, you know, I think one thing about uh, racial formation. I think the second interesting thing is this idea that racial formation, that race is a constantly um, decentered and unstable category, right? Uh, and I think we really, really need to take that serious, right? And within the Asian American community, I think there is this sort of interesting thing that people who, Asians who lived in America a little bit longer, feel the compulsion to instruct new arriving Asians to instruct them on what being Asian American is, or what being Korean American is, what being Chinese American is. Um, and like in politics, I think it is tempting to sort of tell them like, oh no, you should be democratic, there's this like, history about you know, internment, all this racial injustice and all of that, and we might even preach it to multi-millionaire Koreans, right, who just arrived to live in their great big mansion in South Orange County. Um, as somebody who do that all the time in the community, sometimes when I drive home, I'm just thinking like, what entitles me to define what Asian American politics is, right? Um, I just don't have an answer for that. But I think that the seriousness of the decenteredness of racial formation, in a weird way, is that we need to take ownership of the process is constantly politic, right? And I wonder if there are any like real moral ground that we stand on, right? to prescribe a particular kind of Korean Americanness that makes me comfortable, but might not be recognizable or antithetical to other Korean Americans, right? And so, um, and so, so that's, I think, a vexing question that we really don't have an answer to, other than, you know, within these communities, we need to have it out, right? There is no reason why, you know, we need to uh, think of our own communities as places that should not be contested or that is free of contestation. Sure.
see a couple of hands in the... Yeah. Okay, uh, thank you very much. Oh, there's no mic on here. Is yeah. it on? Can you hear? Yeah, it's on. Okay. Um, so, you know, today we've heard almost entirely praise uh, for Michael and for his work. Uh, there are a lot of people who have praised Michael and his work. There are others who have applauded him. There are others who have critiqued him. There are others who have been outraged and rejected his work. We don't have to mention any names. Okay. And yesterday I read an article, an interview with Guy Pearce, the actor, and he said there's a lot of people around you just like to punch in the face. Okay. Michael is not one of them, but I bet Michael's come a lot across a lot of people he like to punch in the face. But it's not his personality, and here's my point. In the 37 years I've known him, I've never heard him raise his voice in anger or say a bad word uh, when there were many opportunities when he should have. <laughs> and, uh, you know, where do you get this incredible patience and tolerance? I don't know. You know, my mother used to say to me, I need the patience of the saint to deal with you, Stephen. <laughs> Michael has the patience of a saint. I don't think he's religious, but I'm not sure. And I think this is another one of his... Uh, uh, very lovable characteristics, which we should all try to emulate. Thank you. <laughs> um, I was an undergrad student um, with Michael Omi, who was my mentor then, who was my mentor as a grad student. And I um, don't know whether to blame him or to thank him for getting me my professorship at UC Davis. But it was him, and we told, I told this story many times, my first Asian American Studies course was, he was up there with his black Armani suit, his Hamilton watch, and I just looked at him and I said, I want to be just like you when I grow up. <laughs> <laughs> and that's all I was, you know, so when I bought my vintage Armani suit, I was like, yes, I'm going to show this off. But, um, but I actually, I wanted to say um, about your scholarship and your work and the impact so for me, the most profound thing about racial formation is this concept that was you know, extremely radical, especially when it came about, which is this idea of power constructing race um, for the purpose of, of extracting resources and dividing those who you know, would come um, you know, unjustly, right? So my question moving forward for the next generation of scholars and even yourself, because it seems like you and Professor Winant are still at it and still having those conversations for decades to come. So my question is, knowing darn well that race was formed in these ways, to divide us in these ways as we're trying to come together in these times, how do we want to move forward to radically challenge this idea of even race itself? In the midst of knowing that there is, you know, the, the patriarchy and white supremacy and that absolutely racism is here and exists, but it was created very consciously, right? So how do we talk about race when we know race itself is a fallacy? So that's, that's my main question. Uh, I, I do think that uh, Michael Logan is something of a saint. Uh, in one of the classes that I TA for him, Joe the, the very, very famous Joe Fong of the uh, Joe Fong boys uh, came and gave a wonderful talk uh, in the Asian American 145 class. The very first thing he says uh, is that uh, Michael only is the Asian American Smokey Rise. <laughs> And uh, Michael Omi, you know, just laughed it off, and I thought, oh, uh, nothing could get Michael upset. Um, Edward's telling little stories here, uh, and taking a moment, feeling a moment here and there, to the Q&A, just to say thank you to Michael. I think one of the things that I remember is Michael, uh, in my case as well, was that he reached out um, to uh, but he was reached out to offer counseling. Someone said counseling. Michael was a counselor for us in many ways as we went through graduate school. He ha had a demeanor that allowed us to think that we were part of an academy. And I'm speaking from um, myself, who was born in a village in Vietnam during the Vietnam War, and that I made it to Berkeley as a postdoc. And the fact that he was just patient, I didn't even mention that. 
the, he just said, welcome, what do you want to do? It wasn't like the professors I had in graduate school, right? <laughs> Who had these certain criteria that had to go to school. Just gave me the space to figure out who I was in the academy um, and feeling very marginalized beforehand. So I want to say for many of us that ever I have talked, we come from immigrant or refugee, working class, low income families, that the fact that we made it to the academy and Michael said, welcome, you belong here, and I want you to thrive in his own way, I think is a powerful statement to his legacy that many of us are all over the country and we have continued his work to um, expand our field, to diversify, if you can, our institutions, which are in many ways, in many ways, still entrenched in a white supremacist ideology. So we continue, um, because of his um, uh, encouragement, because of his support, even after I was done uh, with a postdoc, and like so many of us who have done with our degrees, or uh, that he continued to encourage us to push us to promote our work, like Nadia, Nadia said. So just a personal thank you um, to you. Uh, my suggestion to answer Kimberly's question is that um, Michael and Howie should write the fourth edition. <laughs> <laughs> because as we all know this, and I'm going to answer very quickly that, we grapple with the terms, you know, how you so I think, okay, race is not right, I use racialization, that's not correct. But we don't even have words or discourse or language or terminology to explain what it is we're doing. And I know there's a new word, BIPOC, and all of these new terminologies <laughs> for groupings. But do they really convey complexity? Um, so we're constrained by the language we still are using that hasn't been updated. So I still think we're in a place where our, our ideas are ahead of even the terminology because race is what the public still understands. Although as academics, we don't use the term race assimilation, or a lot of the terminology, but it still resonates with the general public. And so that's our um, Just quickly, just yes and three cheers to the ripple effect of Michael Omi. Absolutely <laughs> um, amazing. And just the thought I had in trying to connect the question um, with, I think it was Howie's um, invitation, if not challenge, to think about what anti-racist projects are. Um, I think there's a that's a wonderful set of doors to open. Um, and the first thing that came to mind was thinking about, gosh, given recent events, even trying to push forward a belief in facts and empirics and science, right? Like even that matters, right? Um, and I think even as as you put it, right, race is um, a fallacy and it's altered, right? So, um, so I think I'm going to be puzzling over right, what anti-racist projects are, um, trying to think about them and worry them and figure out how to get engaged in That's all. Well, uh, thank you for, for all of that. So, first of all, you know, thank you, Professor <laughs> Park, Professor Vasquez Tocos, um, Professor Wu, um, Dr. Wu, hopefully he's still there, <coughs> Professor Bernon, and Professor Feldman. You know, for really taking us, you know, through from the from the macro to the you know to the intimate, you know, through the rich intersecting terrains of the in communities across communities in the U.S. transnationally and globally uh, that have been shaped and contoured and certainly imprinted, you know, by the uh, by racial formation and Michael's you know, various contributions, uh, both within the academy and beyond. So thank you so much for the, those for those very generative thoughts and profound and insightful um, reflections. Please join me in thanking the panelists once again. So with that, we conclude this panel, and uh, now comes the party.